Welcome to the Ortho Real Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, we have got a real treat for you today. Probably the hottest topic in knee replacement surgery the last few years is the concept of kinematic alignment. And my guest today is virtually synonymous with the term. Uh, hello and welcome, Dr. Stephen Howell. Thank you very much, Dr. Barber, for having me. Uh, we greatly appreciate you coming on and spending some time with us. Um, I guess maybe before we dig into this, uh, tell everybody, I guess, a little bit about your career and, and where you are and where you where you practice and what you do in your practice. Okay, well, I actually live out in uh, near Sacramento, California, and I practice at uh, an Adventist Health Lodi Memorial Hospital in Lodi, which for those that are into wine, I'm sort of a Bud Light guy myself, but they actually make more, more, more wine is produced in Lodi than Sonoma and, and uh, Napa and Monterey counties combined. So it's a big wine area. But regardless, I've been down there and uh, my primary practice is uh, knee arthroplasty. And so, you know, I typically do 10 a week uh, and, uh, you know, they're all kinematically aligned. And I started that project way back in 2006 with PSI and the Otis knee. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that was sort of the first commercial product uh, for uh, doing kinematical. And we didn't know the terminology back then. We were just trying to, by our understanding the lab at UC Davis with Professor Hull, we we knew at that time, based on work from others as well, that there were these three axes in the knee about which the tibia uh, flexes and extends uh, on the femur and the patella flexes and extends on the femur and the tibia internally and externally rotates on the femur. And so when you uh, line to the mechanical axis, which by the way, is it an axis? It's an angle. I mean, there's nothing kinematic about the angle that connects the femoral head to the knee to the ankle. And uh, so we knew that that really, it didn't have much to do with how a knee works looking at those distant landmarks. And it just became very, very simple. You just resurfaced the knee. That's what kinematic alignment is. You resurfaced the knee where the patient's prearthritic joint lines were which means you match the distal and posterior joint lines of the femur, you match the slope when you retain the PCL, and you match the varus valgus orientation of the tibia. So, Well, I do remember the, uh, the Otis Med system um, and, and some of the initial uh, furor around that. Um, so even we've got a really varied audience, everything from patients to therapists to certainly surgeons and people in the device industry, but bringing this back further, just really bare bones, really simplistic. If a patient comes in to Dr. Howell's office or better yet. So I've just met you at a, at a Christmas party. And I was like, listen, Steve, I've heard, I've heard this. People are telling me you're a really big deal. Um, what is it that you, you do that is different with knee replacement? What, what's this whole idea? And I, I'm not somebody medical or orthopedic. Well, I, I mean, if people do ask that in the office. They say, hey, what, what do you do that's different? From there? And I said, well, what I used to do and what uh, many surgeons still do is we, we align the knee the same in everybody. And I say, well, when you go to the beach or you're walking in the mall or down the street, especially in the summer where the legs are exposed, I mean, you see people are knock knee and people are bow-legged and people have so-called straight legs. And it's just a variety of normal. And yet when we, when we do knee replacement, we – eliminate all that variability and put everybody to this imaginary non-functional straight line. And so I said, if I was to do your knee the way that I used to do it, I would just drop a plumb bomb, bob, a plumb bob from the center of your hip to your ankle, slide your knee underneath, whether it's bow legged or not, and cut the bones perfectly to that line. And I said, that puts the knee in crooked to the soft tissue envelope. I said, well, what do you mean it's crooked? I said, well, look at the door on the wall. I said, when, when you do the mechanical alignment, you take the door out, you try to find a door the same size and put it back in, but you put it in crooked, crooked to the frame. And then a couple things happen. It gets stuck. And then there's gaps in another spot where the wind blows in and out. And when you do mechanical alignment, you go and cut a perfectly normal ligament to try to make that door work in the frame where the carpenter would say, you know, it's not fitting in the door frame. Door frame's the standard. And in ligament, in the ligaments and the knee, the ligaments are the frame. The ligaments are the frame of the knee. So when your parts are crooked to the joint line, they're crooked to the frame. And a mechanical alignment surgeon, the technique I used for years, 
simply just keeps recutting these normal ligaments, which is not necessary. So kinematic laminar resurfaces the knee. It puts the knee in where the door is supposed to be in the frame. It puts the knee in where the ligaments expect the parts to be. And therefore, the recovery is faster. It's much less painful. It's easier to do a, a discharge a surgery on the same day. And the patients uh, are happier. And actually, the implant survivor is, is better than with KMA. Uh, so you have all these benefits with kinematic alignment. Better survival, quicker recovery, less pain and a a more consistent function and satisfaction outcome for the patient. So in that analogy, the surgeons that are making everybody straight, uh, aligning things mechanically, they're spending too much time going back and working on the frame to try to correct it to the the door that they just put in. Does that follow the analogy? Yeah, Yeah, it's sort of crazy. I mean, you know, why would you put it in crooked to begin with? And of course, this is back to dogmatic teaching from 30 or 40 years ago. That this was an important concept. And maybe in the day it had some relevance, but there's been too many, you know, nice, uh, nice work done by Hirschman and others around the world uh, in Japan, everything that, you know, the knee isn't that way. The knee varies. Just, I mean, when we do any other joint in the body, the hip, the ankle, the shoulder, we try to restore the kinematics. When we do mechanical alignment, we intentionally destroy the kinematics of the knee. That's what we do. So if I'm a patient then and I'm, I'm coming to see you and I've, uh, I've just seen Dr. X in Chicago the week before and he's told me about how he wants to do my knee replacement, what can I expect in terms of, of what you're going to do for me? Is it going to move differently or better? Well, when we put the knee in, um, we do it with the most accurate technique that's available today, much more accurate than robots because – I can tell a person when I look at their knee and it's bow-legged, the thickness of the cuts I'm going to make. And when I do that, I know I get the parts in the right spot. And then that just promotes more natural movement. I mean, the patient, I show them a little video of where they should be in five weeks. And they should have motion from zero to 120 degrees. Their knee should straighten nicely. So they may still have a little bit of swelling, certainly be a little sore still. And they can gain that motion without going to physical therapy. We don't send anybody to physical therapy anymore because we found the physical therapists hurt our patients. They would push them when they didn't need to. So the first two weeks, we tell them less is more and just keep the leg elevated, uh, get up every hour or so when you're awake, do a short walk, come back, stretch, bend, scrape the knee, prop it up again. And as the spine subsides, and it's usually the discomfort's the worst about the seventh or eighth day, it takes a little turn for the better. And then by two weeks, they can be a lot more active and get back to stuff they want to do. So it's a very important concept for the, for the patient that's now in their 60s and 70s, for the most part, they're depending on their family for assistance during that first two, three, four, five, six weeks. And they've got to have the wife or the husband help them, or if they don't have a, a, a spouse available, then they, they, then they rely on their children or, or, or a grandchildren. And it's nice that the patient knows that when they have it done with kinematic alignment, they're going to have a much lower risk of being dependent on them for an extended period of time, which can happen with the mechanical limit, they're going to also be happy. They don't have to keep going to the physical therapist every two days to have them torture them to try to get the knee to move when the parts are in crooked to the frame. Now, you can have a great result with mechanical alignment. I have plenty of very happy patients with mechanical alignment. So we shouldn't bash the operation. But I will say this, that when the knee works well with mechanical alignment, it's because the surgeon by default put the parts in pretty much kinematically correct. So for us, we take the target to restore the joint surfaces. We do that from the from the get go. You end up with a patient whose recovery is, is 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 enhanced and less of a burden on them and their family. So you hit several uh, interesting points there. And when I talk to patients, I tell them, "Hey, we're doing close to a million primary total knees a year in the U.S. now, and percentage wise, kind of here's what I expect. I mean, there's a very low single digit percentage." Uh, of patients that have a true complication. It gets infected. It gets, uh, you know, horribly stiff. An implant comes loose. There's something that everybody would recognize as a complication. Uh, most patients really have a, a good or excellent outcome, and there is some percentage hanging out there in the middle, 10, 15, 20, maybe even 25% that are dissatisfied, if you will, and he doesn't feel natural. Something about it is, is not right to them. Um, one, do you think that's accurate? And, and two, 
if if we do the knee your way, if we go kinematic alignment, what can we expect as far as how those percentages might move? I think you can uh, you you can measure uh, the response of the patient to the operation many different ways, but I think one of the things we've learned with kinematic alignment is the one metric we use is called the forgotten joint score, and that metric is a way of the patient saying, you know, I really don't know I had a knee replacement. I feel like my own knee. Now we don't get that all the time, but when you look at the patients we're doing now, which there's a large population of these 50 year olds that want to be 40 year olds and 60 year olds that want to be 50 year olds who have monoarticular arthritis from an ACL injury they might've had in their twenties or teens and they want to stay active. And so I don't think that we're operating on grandma anymore and grandpa. I think we're operating on people who want to have a lifestyle that is unaltered as they age as best as they can with their physical capabilities, their hearts and their lungs. So people want to get back and maintain the ability to play sports, to hike, to bike, to even, uh, you know, uh, 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 be, be, be active in tennis and pickleball. And that I think is what we can achieve with kinematic alignment and with a medial stabilized knee with a ball and socket that provides ACL like stability get these patients, give them the option to get back to the sports and activities they want. And, uh, and, and to me, I don't think you can do that with any level of consistency with a posterior stabilized knee put in with a mechanical alignment or the, these low conforming knees where the inserts are relatively, let's say, not fit to the medial condyle and have uh, anterior and posterior lips in the lateral side that block rotation. And, and, and so with kinematic alignment, it enables you to put in a knee prosthesis that is built with the geometry of the native knee to enable the function of a native knee, restore that ACL that we take out when we, the ACL stability that we, we always take out uh, when we do total knees and that's missing in 25% of the patients that we do total knees on. So, so I think what can we say to the patient is we have an operation for you now. Uh, we don't have to wait till you're 70 years old. The, the, the problem with polywear, I mean, it can happen. But if the parts are in right with KA, it's a decades-long problem, and it's a simple swap out uh, of the plastic. We, we, we really don't see tibial component loosening with KA. That's a mechanical alignment problem. That's due to the cutting the tibia, uh, the femur in varus, and the tibia in valgus, the native joint line. It's, it's endemic in any technique that changes the joint line. So implant survivorship, I don't say to the patient, I say, you should take that thing with you. You know, if you're 60 years old, you should take the parts with you. Go out and enjoy your knee, do whatever you want. And, uh, and I think the, the ability to get people back with, in a more consistent way uh, to that type of level of activity is something we can do now, which we couldn't do prior to kinematic alignment. In some of that response, I think you may have answered my next question. But if we shift over from patients to surgeons now, um, and let's just um, – you know, this is not me, but let's say a, a, a fairly prototypical surgeon that says, okay, uh, I do some general orthopedics and I do probably 150 knee replacements a year. Um, I'm, I'm pretty happy with them in, in my mind. Anyway, I think, uh, my patients are doing pretty good. Why should I do this? Why should I, why should I switch over? Well, I think from a surgeon point of view, first place, it's, it's, it's an easier surgery to do because, to be honest with you, I don't use the x-rays in the operating room. Kinematic alignment is not an angular operation. It's a bone resection operation. It, it's, it's just like the carpenter that's fitting a piece of molding back up on the wall that might have broken. They, they, you're, you're making your decisions on what you're seeing in front of you, in the knee, not where the hip and ankle is. So our instruments reference the bone and the cartilage on the distal femur and posterior femur, and we have shims to account for cartilage wear. So when I see a virus knee, it's already planned. You know, if my implant's nine millimeters thick distally and eight millimeters posterior, I'm going to resect six millimeters distal medial, eight distal lateral, and seven posterior. That's a virus knee, every virus knee. And, and that way, you, you can move through the operation because the femur is set first, the VV cut on the tibia is correct, and restores the patient's prearthritic alignment. With it. When the knee is in extension, there's no VV laxity. If in full extension, the lateral side's opening, then you didn't cut enough virus on the tibia. So, so you have all of these interoperative checks 
that allow you to quickly move through the operation. So your operating day is shortened. You're not spending time goofing around with ligaments that are perfectly normal and trying to get the knee to move when, when it's not. It allows you to retain the PCL, which gives the knee a better internal rotation when the knee flexes, which is necessary for patellofemoral tracking. And then, you know, your post-op visits go way down. I mean, you see these people back in six weeks, 90% of them you won't see again until you do the other knee. So you don't have your office encumbered by all of these patients. And then, of course, since, you know, we use a block in the knee, we don't use uh, nerve blocks because our anesthesiologists vary in, in capability. And uh, so we have a 90 cc injection we put in the knee within three minutes of the incision on the bone, not in the soft tissues, but up on the femur. That lasts till the next afternoon. 85% of our patients take 20 pain pills or less in the operation, after the operation. So it's a, it, 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 it reduces a lot of your work uh, load during the day. You move faster through the operation. So instead of maybe doing three, you can do four, or do four, you can do five. It's easier to get them out of the recovery room if you're doing same-day surgery because they don't have a, a quad knocked out from a block. They don't have excessive pain because we're not cutting ligaments. And they go home and they recover on their own without having the administrations of a therapist tell them you might have an infection or uh, you know, you've got too much swelling. You, you do that education up front and um, your phone calls to the office go down, your visits to the office go down, your patients are happy, they turn around and have the other knee done quicker and they send their friends. So it's just a win-win if you want to build your practice with knee arthroplasty and you can do it in your surgery center without the need to do it in the hospital and all the extra paperwork that that sometimes generates. Okay, so if I'm that prototypical surgeon and you've convinced me and I, I want to do this. So I, I had the pleasure a couple months ago in one of, on one of our previous episodes to talk with uh, Dr. Keith Barron, who I know you know. Uh, and Keith said, hey, a year and a half ago, I just decided we're, we're going to do this. Uh, bring me some instruments in and we're going to get started. But um, maybe for somebody who's not as as prolific uh, at knee surgery and knee implant surgery is Keith. Uh, if they want to get started, if they want to take this on, how do they learn it? How do they go about incorporating that into their OR? Well, I, I think the best thing, uh, you know, there's three, three ways there that you can educate yourself. There's certainly videos up on, on YouTube on my website that we have uh, put out. I also uh, wrote a textbook, uh, Kinematic Aligned Pulling Arthroplasty with Stefano Bini from UCSF and Dax Steele. Uh, as co-editors uh, from um, uh, Jimmy Andrews Clinic. And and that's available on El Sevier or Amazon. You can buy it. Uh, you just look up my name, Howard Beanie, and, and Kinemec Line TK. It's 120 bucks or something. It has videos in there and 19 chapters. And so that's another a good way to uh, to learn. Uh, of course, uh, the implant company. So, you know, there are, there, there are those that are really truly promoting kinematic alignment and others that are just using the term without a sound definition. But uh, there's two implant companies that have kinematically aligned total knee arthroplasty FDA approved, and that is uh, Medacta and Zimmer Biomet. Those are the only two. So you can go to those companies and ask the, ask their sales force or whatever to take you to a course, do some cadavers, visit another surgeon. And that's, the, I think, the one thing with Keith. I, I actually went out to see Keith in April. You know, he switched over in January and uh, – you know, I wanted to see his setup. I wanted to see how his OR worked. I wanted to see how he packaged his instruments because they use, they have a very uh, small, small setup. And I learned so much. I came back and adopted a lot of his principles in my OR in uh, in Lodi. And that made it easier on my staff, my OR text, not opening a bunch of trays. We can do the operation with two trays now. And um, so there's a lot of economies and things that are still to learn. And it's fun to do it because you can put these things into practice in short notice. And, uh, and you move the bar a little bit in your own facility and, and with your own patient. You mentioned a couple of different companies there, and I know uh, originally this went back to uh, Otis Med and an MRI-based system uh, that I, I believe was uh, initially intended with a triathlon implant. Yeah, so when we developed Otis Med in 2006, it was Charlie Chi and Ben Park, two engineers, myself. Um, we actually uh, made the guides for, for uh, the Vanguard by Biomet uh, knee sorry. and for the uh, triathlon knee. Okay. And uh, so we, 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 you know, we just, we, we only needed the MRI of the knee back to what we talked about a little earlier about the kinematic axes. We, we knew that those kinematic axes, the one that the tibia 
plexus and extends around the femur and the patella and then the IE of the tibia and femur. They're related to the native joint line. They're either parallel or perpendicular. And, and uh, when you tilt the implant, the axes don't line up. The knee doesn't move, it's just as I mentioned about the door. So we knew at that time we did not need to have, and we did not want to have, the femoral head or the ankle. It had nothing to do with the function of the knee. And Eckhoff showed that in 2005. So then we uh, we got those guys out, and uh, you know the, the people who used it, were they were really wedded to the concept of the alignment and the efficiencies of the guide. And uh, unfortunately, in 2009, the FDA took us off the market uh, with the product because they said we weren't a substantial equivalent uh, to mechanical alignment, which we weren't. And uh, it took a lot of work from 09 to 17, which is when the FDA made the approvals for the two companies that I mentioned, uh, to get the community, the worldwide community, to think differently about alignment. And we're very indebted to uh, people from other countries. I mean, there's uh, papers have been written out of Germany and out of Australia, New Zealand, and uh, Japan uh, and, and Germany that have been very instrumental in getting people to change their thinking. And uh, right now, uh, I don't think a mechanical alignment is hardly used much in Europe anymore. There is kinematic alignment or some, uh, how should we say, I don't like, well, an alteration of the technique, which is to me a bastardization. I mean, kinematic alignment is very simple. Either you resurface the knee or you don't. And so if you're the type of person that's a little hesitant, which I was initially at first as well, because it's a process, you see a deformity saying, I don't really want to do MA. Okay, I'm a little worried about it. Okay, do MA. I think it's better to restrict who you do early on rather than restrict how much you correct the knee, so to speak, back to the pre three joint line. I think once you put your toe in the water on a case, you jump in. So once you commit to doing KA, you follow the rules and you resurface the joint in all planes, and that will lead to the better outcome. You, you, touched, a, you touched a couple of things there that I've got some questions written down about already for later, but uh, I want to back up to that. Um, can this work with any implant? This is a very loaded question. Can this work with any implant? Does this work better with certain implants? So, uh, I think that if you were, so my experience is not, uh, how should we say trivial. So I did about 900 Vanguard CRs and then maybe 1300 triathlon CRs and then 500 few Sigmas and a couple thousand persona CRs. And then I did Medacta CS without the PCL and Medacta uh, with a ball and socket with a PCL. And I will tell you the first group up until the sphere, the professor and I, professor Hall and I, we really didn't think the implant made much difference because they were all pretty much the same. They have this relatively low conforming medial compartment and they've added conformity to the lateral compartment. And so the joints, the designs were all very similar. And when you look at a lot of the studies out there, uh, there's two, two randomized trials now, kinematic alignment in, uh, in, in both cohorts. But the ball and socket in one and a CR in the other cohort, ball and socket outperforms. Another one with ball and socket versus PS, the ball and socket outperforms. Okay, I mean, the forgotten joint score is 10, 16 points higher when you have a ball and socket. So I think if you have an implant design that you're using, our own experience is, and a lot of the randomized trials that looked at K versus MA with the same implant showed that the implant, that the KA outperforms MA, and the ball and socket with KA outperforms PS and CR with KA. So if you want the best knee, you do KA with a ball and socket flat lateral insert. You want the next best knee, you use any plant, implant design you want with KA. That's how I would uh, simplify the expression of it. I think that's an important distinction because I think there are, um, you know, I guess depending on your, your thought process, there are, there are one or two implants on the, or maybe three uh, implants internationally on the market that are a, a a true medial pivot, a ball and socket. And there are a lot of others now that are medial congruent or otherwise described as being medially stabilized, but are not a ball and socket. Can you comment on that? Yeah. So those, um, so the, the ball and socket is the most constrained you can be in any articulation. I mean, it's a ball in a socket. And what's the predicate for that? A native knee. 
Tim Sparrow and Freeman described that in 2005 and a few other spinoff articles that when the knee flexes and extends, the medial compartment, they have it in their paper. It's, it's the most unscientific but clear explanation of the medial compartment kinematics. It says the, 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 the medial femur hardly moves on the tibia because it's a ball in a socket. And what are we striving to do? I prefer to retain the PCL because the PCL is what drives internal rotation and keeps your flexion space laxity native. Once you cut it, the flexion space jumps a varying amount from patient to patient, one, two, or during the course of the day, one patient may open a millimeter, someone three. You get three or four, now all of a sudden your flexion space is loose, you stuff plastic in, you can't get the knee to straighten, and then you got a flexion pro- extension problem. So I like keeping the PCL. And you can do that, I think, only with the ball and socket when it's put in with kinematic alignment. And so the real part that you want in the ball and socket is not the anterior lip, but the posterior lip. Because the posterior lip has to be high enough to limit the anterior translation of the tibia on the femur when you're doing activities. And you'll see that when you put the knee in flexion and you have the ball and socket to make line and you do an anterior drawer, it just doesn't move. Mm. So with that, then the rotation of the knee is centered around the medial compartment as the native knee is. And then that allows, as you go into extension, we know the tibia externally rotates the screw home. And when we flex, we know the tibia internally rotates. And so as that external internal rotation is going on, as you extend and flex the knee, that's changing the tension in your retinacular ligaments, which is important for what? For patellofemoral tracking. Not so much that the patella is not staying in the groove, but in terms of causing stiffness in the knee. If that tibia isn't internally rotating, the patella isn't coming with it appropriately. And it's being held up by the implant. The ligaments aren't relaxing properly, and and and, uh, and that leads to that sort of, I think, what people call a tight band feeling around their knee in 90 degrees of flexion. So, what are you doing, Mary? Oh, doc, me and my knee's tight. Well, let me see you move it. And they straighten it all the way. They bend it to 120 degrees, and then you sort of scratch your head. Well, wait a minute. You just moved your knee. Yeah, you but doctor, it's tight. It feels stiff. Well, when is that? And they put their knee around 80, 90 degrees, and they tell you it's stiff right there. And why is it stiff? not stiff because it doesn't move it's stiff because it's stiff because the patient has to apply more flexion force or a more flexion moment to get the knee to move because the ligaments are resisting it. and it's like your fingers in the morning where you get a little older and you wake up your fingers are a little stiff and as the day goes on it loosens but when these knees are not in the correct position the stiffness that you have in the morning in your fingers or the stiffness that you have in the knee in the morning stays throughout the day that, that specific thing that you described, is that is that a tibial translation or rotation thing that's causing that in that moment, or do you, do you know or have a thought? I think that the kinematics, which means, you know, as you passively and actively move the, art, the artificial knee, does it go through the same translations and rotations as a normal knee? And if it does, it's going to feel more like a forgotten joint to the patient. Yeah. And when you do kinematic alignment, because you're resurfacing the knee, you restore the patient's pre-arthritic or native medial lateral compartment forces. They're not too high medial lateral and extension versus flexion. I mean, normal forces in a knee are a little higher medial and lateral and extension. And as you flex the knee, they both decline. But medial is always a little more than the lateral. Any of the four studies done with a Verisense, with MA, functional alignment, restricted kinematic alignment, the forces are all off. You have to be off because the implant doesn't match the joint surface. I mean, think of a plateau fracture. You know, if you had a medial plateau, it's compressed or depressed, you would never put it in, stick it up two millimeters above the old surface, and you wouldn't want to leave it depressed because it causes the medial compartment to be tight or loose. And so the principles we use in fracture care every day to restore the patient's pre arthritic joint as best we can, we completely ignore when we do knee arthroplasty. And you wonder why patients can have a satisfactory outcome when they're 70 or 80 and they're doing low-demand low activities. But you have to tell that 60-year-old, wait till you're older, wait till you're 70. And then you give them that false statement, you got to wait till you're 70 because the implant only lasts 10 years. And that's how you put them off. That's not what the patient wants. And we don't have to sell the information. I mean, if your total knees are not as good as your anterior hips, then we have an answer for you. 
So you talked about the PCL too, and we've been talking about mechanics. Um, there have been a few and still are a few uh, ACL retaining designs in, in the arthroplasty. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? Should we be trying to do that? Is that going to be part of the future, or is it does a, a medial ball and socket sort of obviate the need for that? Well, that, that's a, that's an interesting uh, uh, that, that was an interesting trial was the, the by cruciate knee. I think Bauman had one. Zimmer was working on one, and the theory behind that was by adding the ACL, you would then restore the anterior stability of the tibia relative to the femur and that would give a more normal knee. Of course, it didn't work out. Why? Because they put the parts in crooked. They put the knee in with mechanical alignment that didn't match the joint lines. So I was called in to uh, go to Zimmer when I started uh, working with them in 2016 or 15 or whatever it was. And so in one room, I did a cadaver demonstration with KA and they piped it out to the engineers and so forth. And then after that was over, they said, do you want to do a bike cruciate on the other knee? I said, sure, I'd like to try it. And so I did it, and they had beautiful instrumentation. I'm going to tell you, very elegant instrumentation, do the medial lateral cut. And then I got the knee in there, I couldn't quite straighten it. And when I give it a little push, of course, the ACL uh, um, insertion sort of popped off. And I think, to answer your question, is there a role for bike cruciate? I think it's exceedingly difficult to do for one reason the medial and lateral slope of the tibia, and this is from Hirschman's group, is different. And so when we do a, a kinematically aligned knee, we try to match the medial slope because that's where the socket is and we accept what we get on the lateral side, which is an accommodation that maybe the knee does because we know as we flex the knee, the native uh, joint space is trapezoidal with the lateral side a little more slack than the medial side. You see that when you scope the knee all the time. So, so I think that when you do bicruciate retaining total knees and they've now you know, fallen into disfavor, you, you really run the risk of stiffness and avulsing that ACL because it's such a difficult thing to, to set the slope independently medial lateral when the slope of the patient's uh, tibias vary so much from between each other. We've talked a little bit about it, and you kind of, I feel like, came back to it with some of those statements. Is the is the medial compartment the, the center of the universe in a, in a knee arthroplasty? Yeah, it, it truly is. It's the center of the native knee. And, and it's curious, if you go back to Hollister in, 2000, in 1993, she was a hand surgeon in the Letterman Hospital, uh, I think a resident in the, in the, in the Letterman Naval Hospital in, in uh, San Francisco. And she found the axis in the femur about which the tibia flexes and extends very eloquently. It's in core. You can look it up. But in that study, when they did it, the, the knee, the cadaver knee, was held, and the tibia was allowed to distract. And when you rotate the tibia, pivot it around the middle of the knee. But when you load the knee, because the medial meniscus is relatively firmly attached to the periphery of the tibia by the coronary ligament, and as you know, compression then, as you put weight on the leg, sort of centrifugally tries to expand the medial meniscus, which it doesn't do because of the circumferential fibers leading to very high hoop stresses, which forms fairly rigid socket. That's why when under compression, the tibia into an extra rotates about the femur. In full extension to 10 degrees, it's a little different because of the screw home mechanism and the, and the, and the notch on the lateral uh, uh, femur. But, but once you flex a couple of degrees, it's all medial pivot all the way. And then it, you got to look at the lateral side because Fukubayashi, way back in 1976 or 7, did a study looking at what happens when you take the uh, lateral meniscus out, the stability of the knee and the cadaver, and it doesn't really do anything. I mean, the medial meniscus is stabilizing and load-sharing. The lateral meniscus is not stabilizing but load-sharing. Why? Because there's no coronary ligament. And when you see those MRIs of people in deep flexion trying to understand you know, how the meniscus moves, you'll see that the medial femoral condyle stays perfectly centered. But the lateral side, the lateral, lateral femoral condyle in deep flexion tries to roll off the back. And sure. it does so because the lateral meniscus allows that, it has that translation relative to the tibia. So when you add an anterior lip on a lateral compartment, you block external rotation. When you add a posterior lip, uh, you block internal rotation. And it's the posterior lip on the lateral insert that causes 
so-called paradoxical movement of the medial femoral condyle. We have a lot of kinematic studies that are published, uh, kneeling and bending and so forth. But when you go from zero to 30, if you have a persona or a vanguard or a triathlon, and you compare it to a true ball and socket, they're the same for the most part. You know, stays pretty centered medial and the tibia until you rotates. But when you have a lateral lip posteriorly, uh, once you get to about 30, 40 degrees, the tibia is trying to internally rotate, but it's blocked depending on how snugly you put the knee in. And then the tibia is trying to internally rotate because the retina after ligaments want to do that and PCL wants to drive it and it can't. So then what happens is the medial femoral condyle moves anterior, which effectively internally rotates the tibia relative to the femur, but that anterior slide can cause symptoms. Not so much in grandma doing grandma things or grandpa doing grandpa things, but when you're out there exercising for a half hour, an hour, you get what I call an exercise induced intolerance to the knee. And, and that is an example is, you know, the patient comes in and says, doctor, uh, you know, my knee gets sore and swell sometimes. Oh, oh well, 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 when does that happen? Well, I go for a walk with my husband. I, I walk a mile around the lake. Yeah, that's fine. But, but if I go and walk for uh, 45 minutes, my knee will start to ache. And they often point anterior medial. It's either the rotation or the shucking back and forth. And then I'll say, well, if I go an hour, sometimes it'll swell and I can't walk for a day. And then as a total knee surgeon, I was always thought to lower the expectation and tell them, well, you should be thankful. You know, you don't have a stiff knee. It's not unstable. You can walk a mile. Boy, that's really a good achievement. But I don't think people want to hear that anymore. And I really don't want to offer that type of operation. I want to offer an operation where if the person wants to walk three miles or four miles with your husband or put a backpack on and go up down the hill, go ahead and do it. And I don't think you can do that unless you have the medial ball and socket, and it's got to be a socket. If we're assuming an experienced kinematic alignment surgeon uh, for this next question, you know, we've got this population. It's really quite a large population of total knees being done uh, now. Uh but in a lot of sense, uh, these patients are very different, and we certainly see patients at different different levels of health, different body weights. But even with the knee, uh, patients with large contractures, with large coronal plane deformities, either fixed varus or fixed valgus, is there somebody that walks into your office and you say, eh, that's too far gone for kinematic alignment? Uh, I'm still looking for that patient. <laughs> okay. I'm still looking for it. Um, and you know, there are some, I mean, you know, I began in 06, I was doing 75 total knees a year. I was really an ACL surgeon and I thought, and early on we just did simple stuff, but then occasionally you get forced into doing something due to the patient. So I remember a guy had a crocodile bite, had big deformity on his femur from a fracture. It was infected. He had a free flap. I mean, you weren't going to go change that femur. You, you, you can't change the malalignment of the femoral fracture. You're just lucky the guy's still got a leg. And so I said, well, let's do a chemical we want to fill the thing. And uh, so you just put it in. And you just have to tell the patient that we're going to. So I'll often take the patient if they're, if they're a virus knee or something, and they're, and they're in front of me, you know, I get the knee in extension, and I'll point out on the x-ray, I'll say, you know, you're, the inside of your knee, the medial side, is supposed to have five millimeters of cartilage. And uh, if you look at your, at your x-ray, it's bone on bone. Now, watch when I do this, and they'll, you can ask, ask them and put the drilling field open and close. And so I tell them for every millimeter that I shim the joint open on the worn side, the ankle moves six millimeters over for typical length tibia. So if I pick up four or five millimeters of cartilage, a millimeter bone in the medial compartment, the ankle's going to move over 30 millimeters. That takes the deformity away. And so we correct the patient's deformity back to the pre-arthritic alignment. You see some of these valgus knees, oh my God, it's 20 degrees valgus. <laughs> Those patients typically have a flexion contracture. And when they have a flexion contracture and they stand up and, and, and uh, their legs way out to the side because when that knee flexes, the lateral femoral condyle, which at 40 degrees of flexion is missing cartilage, and the posterior lateral or posterior half of the lateral tibial plateau missing three millimeters of bone in cartilage, that femoral condyle drops in the hole. And when it drops in the hole, it makes the deformity look worse than it truly is. And that's why the valgus knee, everybody gets nervous about it. For us, it's just the kinematic principles on the lateral, on the valgus knee is just like the medial. 
so the same thought process is go through, restore the joint line, restore the joint line, and, and that takes care of the, that deformity in those patients. So do we straighten anybody? So you have to say to the patient, you know, if you look at the patient in the pre-op area and they say, yeah, will you give me a straight leg, doctor? I said, well, I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to straighten your leg. Like, I'm going to straighten your leg like it was when you were 20 years old before you had developed arthritis. Oh, well, thank you, doctor. Well, they're happy about that. And you might point out that you think, you know, you, you actually have your other knees a little knock kneed and they may say to you, yeah, it is. And I said, well, I'm going to make you less knock knee on the side that I'm working on back to like your other knee. Or they may say, I never really knew I was knock kneed. So you have to get, I think, it's, it's, it's a reprogramming of your mind to just say, we're looking at the knee to restore the femur and then cut the VV of the tibia so that we restore a tight rectangular extension space, which everybody has. And, and that, by default, restores the alignment. And we have plenty of CT-based scanograms and stuff, studies published on this that is very effective doing that. I've heard in some circles and, and maybe perceived myself that patients who start off with a varus knee are, are very comfortable uh, afterwards still maintaining some varus, but that maybe there's a difference with a valgus knee that some of those patients that start off in valgus are, are expecting it to be straighter or maybe don't tolerate residual valgus. Is that your experience at all? Or is that something we've made up or where does that come from? I mean, here's the thing. When you do KA, a lot of the, a lot of the thoughts and principles you have with MA, you, you sort of have to put them in a different hat. Yeah. That's a mind shift. Because, as you said, you know, it's interesting. It, yeah, it's a mind shift, and that's why I say, well, you know, we're leaving someone embarrassed. You have to understand, when I do kids, people say to me, how much embarrassed do you cut the tibia? And I said, none. I never cut the tibia embarrassed, and I never cut it in valgus. Well, how could you say that? Because my target is the patient's prearthritic joint line. I'm matching the joint line. So from the knee's point of view, I'm not changing it. Now, if you're doing MA, my question to you would be, how much valgus will you cut the tibia? Because you got to match it. Because when you cut the femur, you put 85% of the femurs in varus. And you wonder why varus tibia component failure occurs with MA. Because 85% of your femoral components are going in varus to the native joint line. And if you don't cut the tibia with an equal amount of valgus, you end up with a double varus deformity. And that's that. I mean, KA, we have RSA study now published this past year in KSSTA. We have... Maximum total point motion, which is the fancy name for tibial base plate migration on the x-axis, y-axis is so-called varus alignment relative to the mechanical uh, line of the tibia. And uh, the regression shows that with more and more varus, the, the migration is actually a little less. It's not statistically different, but it sure isn't going up. And why is that? Because when you do mechanical alignment, you widen the gate. You make the joint oblique to the floor. Patient's got to widen the gate. Then the adduction moment goes up. The adduction moment then causes lateral liftoff, especially if the knee is not balanced. The medial side course is embarrassed when you do MA because the femur is embarrassed, and then you get all these problems. KA reduces the adduction moment, restores normal forces, retains normal ligament, restores normal alignment, enables the use of a ball and socket stability and normal joint geometry of the native knee. Those are all benefits, and those are all negated with this illogical, from a knee point of view, mechanical alignment. In, in long, and this is, this is related back sort of to the other question of maybe if a knee has gone too far, but I'm just, just throwing out some things that, that you hear that are maybe, uh, if not objections, things that get brought up. In longstanding knee arthritis, is, is there, separate and apart from cartilage loss, is there any metaphyseal remodeling and do ligament stretch? Uh, yes, I, I'm going to, I'm going to switch it if you don't mind to the ligament question sure. first. And, uh, you know, when I started off in 06, I mean, I would come back from a meeting, you know, and I'd see the three types of virus deformities described by, I forget who it was, and maybe it was Leo and the three types of valgus deformities by Krakow. And then I measured the angle, uh, you know, with the goniometer and it's, oh, I'm right at the boundary between type two and three. And then I think of all these ligaments I'd have to release and get constrained implants ready and all this kind of stuff. And then 
when I started doing the Otis knee, I could only do one a day because we could only build one guy a week, but I might have three total knees or four total knees on the day, and the other, the others are done with MA. And, uh, you know, I did the K, and oh, I didn't take as much bone off the femur, but distally as I do. And then I'm not releasing a ligament, and the knees moving work better. And, and then I do a mechanical line. I didn't release a ligament. And then I do the next one. Oh, I'm in a little bit of trouble here. Start to cut stuff. And I justified that because when I went to those meetings back in those days, the surgeons, the arthroplasters would tell me these ligaments contract. Now, after you've done 6,000 of these knees and you've yet to find one that's contracted and you haven't really found any that's truly stretched out unless there was some multi-ligament injury. I mean, of course, the PCL could be torn or something. But if you're finding that you're releasing tight ligaments more than a couple times a year, I would suggest that you're putting the parts in crooked to the native joint line. The one caveat I will say is the patient with the really chronic ACL uh, deficient knee, and what I mean by that is they've got the flexion contracture and on the medial side, sometimes lateral, but also medial, where the wear is really posterior. And that tibia has been way forward. I, on occasion, will find that I've got a great balanced knee and extension. I go to 90. And I've got a little lift off at the insert. And I, did the PCL contract, you know, because it's been back so far? Or is there additional scar tissue in the capsule behind there that's not letting it go? You're speaking of lateral condylar lift off in that flexion space? Well, no, what the insert lifts off, you uh, know, the, the so called uh, the polo. You remember the thing uh, that Dave, uh, 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 Dick Scott talked about pull out and lift off of the insert. So extension, nice flexion, and that insert on the base plate just starts to tilt up. And uh, and you say, well, wait a minute. I got this imbalance in the flexion space. In those two times a year out of four or 500 knees, three times a year, I'll recess the PCL. And then the tibia goes back, sits in the socket. And because I have a ball and socket anyway, I have the same insert that works with CR, or with, works with posterior cruciate ligament retaining and resection. So... So that's an advantage of that geometry uh, or design is that you can really transition if you don't want to keep the PCL. But I think uh, the more you do KA knees, the more you realize that the PCL can be maintained and it does promote the internal rotation. It doubles it relative to when you cut the PCL. So cut the PCL, internal rotation, zero to nine is about seven degrees. Uh, you keep it in place, it's 15 degrees. What's a normal knee? About 15 degrees. So you get closer to normal kinematics with the PCL in place. So a little further back, you, you mentioned some names there, and, and even with your last comment, brought something back to me. Um, so this is, this is a multi, multi-part question or just a, a, a something to think about or to discuss. So you mentioned Dr. Krakow, of course, and if we go way back, we think about uh, he and Dr. Hungerford, uh, my mentor, uh, Tony Headley, uh, what they were doing with, with PCA knee uh, in the day where there was a relative uh, anatomic alignment where if we use those kind of classic MA terms, we would say the femur was cut in valgus, the tibia was cut in varus, um, sort of what you said of, you know, Dr. Krakow's monograph that everybody in the country had about pre-op measuring and, and where we want to put the alignment of these components. Um, I feel like uh, kinematic alignment certainly has some features of that, but then maybe your comment too about uh, are we bastardizing this technique? I hear things like inverse kinematic alignment thrown around or uh, patient-specific alignment or KA light or, or some, um, some other terms that are for, for something that nobody really seems to have a a hard definition. I mean, I think certainly you, uh, more so than anybody, can define what kinematic alignment is, uh, but we've got some of these other things floating around out there. Do you have any idea about what they mean or if they're valid or if they're they're going wrong or what's happening with those? Well, I would say relative to MA and relative to what we have done and others have done in the kinematic alignment space, the other techniques really just have not done their homework. There's not any clinical results on functional alignment. There's no comparative studies. Uh, and when they, you look at it for functional alignment, for example, the forces are too high. There's a nice study out of uh, uh, Ferris Haddad's group, and 
the forces with a virus sense, we allow all the same throughout the motion arc, except for they begin the evaluation at 10 degrees of flexion. Well, why don't they show full extension? Because the forces go through the roof. And that's been the same with MA. You look at any MA Verisense studies, they never show. Oh, only Mangini showed full extension because they stuff the flexion space to get the knee stable. And when they go to extension, the forces go up. Okay, we measure those forces. We don't have a high forces. That's why the motion comes back so easy. So I really don't think that any of those techniques will lead to any better outcome than MA and may actually have downside because they're not balancing the knee properly and they have to still occasionally cut ligament. And so there is nothing really kinematic about any of that and because the target of restoring the joint surface, which is necessary, so the axes and the components are co-aligned with the axes in the patient's periarthritic knee are achieved. And uh, so the driving point behind restricted and functional alignment is that you need to look at the hip and the ankle to set the compartment position. That justifies the technology in their mind. But from the knee's point of view, the technology isn't needed because we don't need to find the femoral head of the ankle. In fact, we want to ignore it. I no more want to look at a femoral head and ankle when I'm doing a total knee than I want to look at the patient's ear, chin, or nose. That's about as useful as those landmarks are for how a knee works. So once you, you, it takes a while to get that out of your head. And that's why you mentioned earlier about Dr. Barron, for him to make the move, you have you have no idea how thankful I am that he has done that. And you have no idea how thankful I am that he has published the results, his early results, comparing his first 100 KA knees with the spear versus his last 200 MA knees, showing that the flexion's better, uh, the manipulation rate is down, the revision or the release rate of the ligament is down. He and, and, uh, I, and I believe David Crawford's now come around, his partner of all, they're all going all in. But it's harder for the MA trained arthroplasty surgeon to get it than a sports surgeon not trained in arthroplasty. The sports surgeon gets it immediately because they spend all day trying to restore these ligaments that are torn in an athletic contest or a, or a, or a work injury. And it's, very, it's an anesthetist to go and cut a perfectly good ligament. And that is where I come from. I'm not an arthroplasty surgeon. I wasn't formally trained. I'm a sports surgeon, but the sports surgeons understand how the ligaments work and I'm not a hardware guy. So when you go back to the valgus knee, what you find is you, you don't even have the revision stuff up. You can do those knees with primary components. That's some great points there. And I, I think you're, you're exactly right. And I think it's, uh, for those of us in the space, that's pretty compelling for, uh, Dr. Barron, who is certainly if not the one of the most prolific unicompartmental arthroplasty surgeons in the world to say, I'm doing fewer unis now because I don't feel the need to push those indications quite as far because I'm getting such great results with a total knee now. Uh, that is, that is deeply interesting. Well, you know, when you, when you look at the uni guys, cause you know, Dr. Barron was very big, very big and still does, I think a lot of mobile bearing unis. Uh, and I'm not sure if he's doing as many mobile bearings now, but he did. And I, my very good friends, Andrew Price and uh, Will Jackson at Oxford, those guys are in on KA now with the, with the medial ball on socket knee. And it, we had a, one of those zoom calls or something. And I asked, I asked Will, I said, what are you doing now? You still doing as many unis as, and then he says, as a typical Brit with, he goes, when that ACL is dodgy, I don't hesitate to do kinematic alignment. And if you really look at the Oxford knee score, which in my early days was the metric we used because the forgotten joint score evolved over the last 10 years or so, but in 06, 08, 09, it was mainly Oxford knee score. We did KA and our scores pre-op, the median mean value was 20. And our values afterwards, at, you know, six months in a year and three or whatever, 42, 43. And then I'd pull out the Oxford mobile bearing knee and I'd look at the forgotten joint or the Oxford knee score. And their studies the preoperative score is 25, five points better than me. So they don't wait for the need to get so bad. And then you see the one year, three year, two year, three, it's 40. So they get a 15 point improvement when I'm getting a 23 point improvement and my value is higher than theirs. And you have to ask the question, why might that be? And my analogy is, let's say you brought your dad in to see me. And let's say that he's got a 64 year old guy fit, 
plays tennis every day, had an old uh, 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 injury, partial medial meniscectomy, and the right knee's virus and worn out. And he says to me, well, Doc, uh, I think I'd like to have a uni. And I say, okay. And he goes, what would it be like? I said, well, why don't I do this? Why don't I go scope your other knee and do a partial medial meniscectomy? And then you go back to the gym and go back playing tennis and tell me how about it. And if you like it, I'll put a uni in. And then he comes back and says, you know something, I'd really want to know, well, how about a mobile bearing? Because that might be less wear and so forth. I said, well, okay, I'll take it back to the OR. I'm going to do a total medium one second. So that's what, I'm, that's what a, that is what a mobile bearing uni is. There, there's no stability afforded by the medial compartment because it's gliding all over the place. And then he says, well, I, I sort of like a, a total now. Good. Let me go back and cut your ACL. And then he wants to be, I'll cut the PCL. Now, when you do kinematic alignment with a medial ball and socket knee, you retain the PCL and you have medial stability, just like you have a medial meniscus. The only question is, is that over constraining the knee? But when you look at the kinematic studies, comparing the mobile brain, and this was done with MA without the PCL to ultra congruent to PS to CR, you still get the normal kinematics with the medial ball and socket. I believe, and it's, you know, my own experience is that retaining the PCL helps promote the more normal kinematics and reduces the risks of that flexion space getting a little sloppy and then accommodating that by adding more plastic and raising the joint line on the tibia in flexion relative to extension, which then, of course, leads to a, a problem. So I don't like to correct a ligament problem by changing implant position. I would prefer to keep the, imp- the ligaments where they are and just resurface the knee. With kinematic alignment, what is the role and is there a role for PSI, for computer navigation, for robotics? I think all those technologies you can use and do kinematic alignment with. But when someone tells me they did kinematic alignment with a robot, but my first question to them is, what were your femoral bone near section? And they go, excuse me? I say, how thick were your femoral bone resection? Well, uh, we planned with a robot and executed it. Okay, I'm going to ask you again, what were the bone resection? I don't know. Then you didn't do kinematic alignment from our viewpoint. Setting the target is not the same as achieving the target when you do the cut. All of those instrumentations have stacked errors in them from image acquisition, segmentation, model building, setting the cut planes with software, which is relatively inaccurate relative to what I'm going to share with you in a minute. So you have all of these things, and there's advantages and disadvantages that surgeons perceive, and if they like what those typical instrumentation systems provide for them, fine. Do kinematic alignment, but please, for the patient's sake, measure the femoral bone resection and determine if you hit your target. Now, how do you do that? You ask the manufacturer, or you take the trial femoral component, and you measure the thickness of the distal and posterior condyles with a caliper. So let's make it simple. Let's say that the distal and posterior femoral condyles are nine millimeters thick. So if I'm doing a patient with patella femoral arthrosis, and there's no tibial Thermal arthritis, what should those thickness of those four resections be? They should be eight millimeters when you measure it. Why? Because the curve for the blade is a millimeter thick. So if you measure eight and add the curve for the blade, and just so we're clear, you know, if you take a, a plank or a board and you cut it halfway across with the saw and take the saw blade out, there's junk missing. And that stuff that's missing is called a curf, K E R F. So when you add that to the imp- to the resection, it should equal the thickness of the implant. It's so simple. So the most important tool in your operating room is the caliper. Because we are using the bone resection to set the implant position such that the axes of the implants are co-aligned to the patient's uh, axes, and that can only be achieved by re- resurfacing the knee. So if you're doing the robot, then... Uh, uh, I, I know at least the Mako, the saw blade's two millimeters thick. So if I was to do that particular knee again, patella femoral, and uh, I think the striker is maybe eight millimeters thick distal and posterior, if my memory's right, 
then all those resections should be six when you measure. And uh, there's a very accomplished surgeon in, uh, in Sacramento who I had a conversation with the other day. We're good buddies, and he just did a Mako, and I, he said, let's take a look at these cuts. And his posterior cuts were six. They were perfect. It was a virus knee, but the distal medial was eight, and the distal lateral was ten. That's a four-millimeter over-resection doing kinematic alignment with the robot. So there's something going on sometimes with how you set it up. And I know this because when I developed PSI, the guy didn't always work. I mean, we thought they did because we thought we did all this computer stuff and that was the answer and blah, blah, blah. But it, I got to the point where I started to measure these resections and I started to understand the resection thicknesses really determined whether I executed the surgery right. And when they didn't match, then I had a problem with the guy. And we had some problems with the guide. Sometimes they warp, they change position. You put it on, you think you got it right, you jiggle it, it locks in, that's it. But if you were to take your time and move it again, it might lock in a different position, and maybe neither of those were the right exact perfect position. The only reason that the PSI guides worked with, with KA is because the target was right. So when our guide missed the KA target, you could maybe say that it's less egregious than when you were striving to hit an MA target in terms of trying to restore the function of the knee. So, Doc, if I back this up to a little more uh, personal level here, you've been at this a long time. This is at or around 20 years now almost, um, and it's it's probably been or felt slow, but uh, there's not many people in the knee replacement space right now that don't have kinematic alignment on their on their mind or on their lips somehow. It's it just seems like it's at every meeting, it's in every discussion. Is that is that really validating? How does that feel? Well, I, I think you're right when you said it's been not been a cakewalk. It's been it's been 16 years, and if you read in the internet, um, I, I remember getting frustrated, like you said, you know, it, and, and how do you handle it? So I'm, okay, I go to the internet, I look up paradigm shift. How long does it take? And then you read, oh, 15 years, 18 years, 20 years. And then I was reading Max Planck because he talked about Einstein, and this is no level like Einstein's work, but the parallels are very similar. So Einstein, he develops relativity. And uh, all the classic physicists are trying to judge the merit of it. They can't. They can't understand it. And then as time goes on, just like you say, we're starting to get validation a bit more at their national uh, level. Uh, his theories proved to be true when they measure things decades later. And Max Planck said, you can't use classic physics to understand relativity any more than you can use relativity principles to understand classic physics. And you really can't use mechanical alignment principles to understand kinematic alignment any more than you use kinematic alignment principles to understand mechanical alignment. They're different. And the, 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 the point that Max Planck made, he said, the only way that this will change is when the next generation comes. And when you look at this 10 years, 15, 20 years, it's a generation. And that's what has happened is some of the old thinking that has been ingrained. And you can see where it came from. I mean, you've got these very senior experienced mechanical alignment surgeon, these major institutions, seeing all these tibial component failures and everything else and ligament problems. And, and they're trying to put it back to, you know, it's, it's a problem with the implant. The surgeon didn't hit these targets and therefore there's an explanation and I can go back and stick these big hardware things in and at least get a stable knee that might move and be somewhat serviceable to the patient. But, but I think for us, we were able to have a more fundamental look at it from how the knee works due to 20, for the professor and I, it's 30 years in the lab looking at meniscal function, ACL function. You know? I mean, when you just look at how to put it in, that solves all these dilemmas for the most part. I mean, the biggest problems I have now is if I fall asleep at the wheel. You know, I'm in the OR and, you know, the big leg or something, and I go, oh, geez, I got in a little close to that MCL. Or, or you know, uh, you know I, I didn't closely look at full extension that I really had a true rectangular gap in a big heavy leg, and I should have maybe recut it another millimeter or two off the medial side or something, got a rectangular gap that leave them a little bit unstable. And when you do that, which happens, unfortunately, still, you know, once every few months, something will happen. And uh, and it really forces you that the principles are sound if you execute it. And, and so you have to develop these verification checks throughout the course of the operation to reduce the risk that you're, because we're human and we have 
manufacturing drift, just like making PSI, the quality of products you make, there's a manufacturing drift sometimes. And you have to recognize that as people, that happens to us. And when you then get confused in the OR, the simple thing to do is stop, get the bone pieces out, get the caliper, measure it. Did I achieve my target on the femur? Take the tibial piece, measure at the base of the spot lines where the cartilage is very little worn. Are the two thicknesses about the same? If you're off, it's a millimeter or so, but you can, if one is eight and the other is 10, you say, okay, if there's the medial size eight and the last size 10, when I get an extension with my spacer block, I should either see the medial space is tight and allow a side opening, or it's okay. And and then if you see that it's tight medial and opening at two millimeters laterally, you take two millimeters off the medial side. That's how you balance the knee. If you're a little tight in flexion, take a look at the medial compartment of the tibial resection. Is the cut surface parallel to what the slope would have been on the native knee? I mean, you have to approximate it, but you can't do it any better with a radiograph or, or planning with a robot. So you, your eye is now looking at these pieces when you do the knee. It's not looking at an angle coming off of a computer screen. It's not looking at the femoral head or ankle. We're looking at the bone in the sections, just like a carpenter would do. You explain this to a carpenter, they understand it immediately. You explain it to a skilled, fellowship-trained, mechanical alignment, arthroplasty surgeon, and they, the wheels get turned. And they get all this confused. They just they get befuddled. So please, if you're going to do KA, as I mentioned before, and you're nervous, do the easy ones first. Put your kinematic alignment hat on. Take your MA stuff. Put it in the bag for that case. If you want to come back and do MA, take your kinematic alignment hat off. Put it over there. Bring your MA1. Do your MA. Follow the rules, the alignment method you're doing in that patient to start with. Don't do restricted KA. Don't use whatever inverse kinematic. And you asked me about that inverse and functional. What it is is they cut the tibia in some degree of, quote, virus to the mechanical alignment, but not always restoring the patient's periarthritic joint line. And then they gap balance the femur to the tibia. So that's over tight in the flexion space in everybody. That's uh, removing the normal trapezoidal space in flexion. And uh, that's not the way the knee wants to work. That's not how the knee does work. And uh, the likelihood of that maybe being a little better than MA, but it it, it won't be like KA if you follow the KA rules. I think, as you said, this is a paradigm shift. This is a completely different way of looking at things. And I think that there probably is some resultant fear or trepidation from the, the classic mechanical alignment trained surgeons that, oh, what if I have this unhappy patient? And they go down the road and they see somebody else who's who's a mechanical alignment guy goes, oh, they put your knee in crooked. I'm going to have to revise this and fix it. So there's there's that that fear there oh, of, just, of, of what happens. Just imagine, just imagine, <laughs> just imagine how it was for me in 2006, uh, 7, 8, yeah. and 9. So you're the only guy in the country. The Everybody else is that other surgeon. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. I, I mean, how many times have been sued? I had one guy downtown that was working me over, and it never went anywhere. Why? Because generally the results were pretty good. And so nowadays, can that happen? This suit because the alignments are crooked to the MA surgeon. I believe it really can't. And why would I say that? You got FDA approval. Now, maybe, maybe if you're not using the implant, you know, that's been FDA approved. But even with that, you should be able to take that there, the, both of the FDA, FDA approvals for the persona and the medacta have no restrictions on the alignment. There's no value that you have to put the alignment to in those FDA descriptions. And I, I, I did hear one surgeon talking about, you know, using the robot and that, you know, that, the, that you have to restrict it based on the if That is not true. Now, it may be true for their technique, but true kinematic alignment, caliper verified kinematic alignment with the persona and medacta, I'll make it perfectly clear because I helped write both of those FDA approvals. And I had to effectively argue that, we shouldn't put a particular angle down because you take an x-ray of somebody and you know this from your own experience, rotate the leg a few degrees and what was an outlier now becomes in range. What becomes in range becomes an outlier. And all of a sudden a big set of problems develop from that. And so there's really, you know, this, this idea that, uh, that you can get into trouble by cutting too much virus or bogus if you put in. And so you say, so 
for me, how do I protect myself? How would I recommend that you protect yourself as a surgeon is I would do the following. Measure the pieces. Put the measurements in your op note. Not in the body of it, but up under the procedure, kinematic alignment, size 7, thermal component, size 5, 5, tibia component, distal medial resection was 6, distal lateral resection was 8, posterior resection medial was 7. And put, put that in there. And then through the document you put down, you restored the extension, the gap, and so forth. That helps you. Now, if the patient comes back, for me, if someone comes into my office after the six-week follow-up for the complaint, then we routinely get the following. We get labs, including separate after protein. We get new knee x-rays, and we get hip x-rays to reduce the risk we're going to miss a hip arthritis that's manifesting as knee pain. And that generally makes everybody feel good, protects yourself that you're not missing an infection, and blah, blah, blah. If at that point it doesn't work, then my recommendation is to get long leg, CT scanogram, AP and lateral, and axial views of the knee. And when you have that in your back pocket, you can go back and someone says, well, you put the parts in too big. They put that in the op note. And you go back and say, well, wait a minute, here's the CT scan. There's nothing here too big. And I believe that protects you. So the simple things are, and you know that patient. Generally, a patient will give you at least one try at trying to fix it. They might often give you the second, especially if they're unhappy and don't get the scat scan. So at, let's say someone comes six months, we go through all of this, everything looks good, and I say, uh, if you're having trouble in six weeks or three months, you want to come back, I'm more than happy to see you. But I'd like you to call the office before you come in, and uh, we'll order this CT scan, and we'll get this additional information. And I think that, that keeps you out of trouble. Good advice. Dr. Howell, can't thank you enough. This has been uh, informative. It's a lot to uh, for people that haven't done it to wrap their head around, but uh, – it is, it is the hot topic right now, and I, I appreciate your commitment to this and spending some time and sharing uh, with all of us about this. Well, it's, I was very anxious to do this with you, Dr. Barber, because I think, you know, I think people can look at me here and see that I'm not 22 years old anymore, and uh, I, I really am looking um, for these young people, you know, the, these, these young surgeons uh, that have an open mind and that will take a look at this and then move the needle forward. And, uh, and, and so if you have that interest, uh, seek out, uh, maybe that you have someone within a hundred mile radius, 200 mile radius, go down and watch them operate. You live out in the Midwest, go see Keith Barron. You live down in Tennessee, you go see Marcus Ford at Campbell Clinic. You're up in the Northeast, you go see, uh, uh Dr. Warham up in Bart Dartmouth. Um, you go in Chicago, you go to, you go to Northwestern, you're out in the West coast, come see me. You go to the Midwest, you can go see, uh, uh, Mike Helman in Kansas city. We got people all over the country and now all over the world, even more so that, that, that you can go and learn this firsthand. And I think you spend a couple hours in the OR, uh, like I did with Keith Barron. Uh, I came back with a lot of information and, and I think it's very worthwhile to do that. So if, if people want to go straight to the source and want to, want to get to you, uh, what do they do? Where do they find you on the internet? Uh, how do they get in touch with you? Well, uh, so the best thing for me, because as you mentioned, there are a few people that do want to stop by on occasion and learn something. So, uh, Monday, Wednesday are my operating days and Medacta sort of takes care of that, uh, that process for me, but I do five total knees on Monday and Wednesday, uh, every week. Uh, we usually start 7.30 and, uh, on Monday, and we're done about 1.30 or so. When I have visitors, it's about 2.30 because we take more time to discuss and, and do things. And, and I think you'll see our, our that it's a very integrated process, as most of the surgeons' practices are. We have anesthesia on board. We have the nurses. We have education. Um, and, and the whole thing is, in, is, is, is trying to get that patient motivated and out of the hospital without having to be admitted with a quick recovery. And, and I think that that has made my life easy. You're talking to me on a Friday. You said, how long do we have? I don't have anything to do. You know, I, I was in the office two days this week. I saw patients on Tuesday and Thursday from 9.30 until 2.30, and I signed up 18 total knees this week. The post-ops, the PA is going to see today at six weeks. She does a better job and talks to them longer than I do. And today she's going to see nine or ten post-ops, and two of those patients, or three, might have bilateral arthritis of the knee, and they'll sign up for the other knee today. I've never seen. So I get this quick turnaround and I don't have to bring these people back in a year because I'll tell you what, that's another thing. You tell fish, you got to come back every year, Mary, have an x-ray of your name. What do you have to tell them? It's going to fall apart. They got to worry from the one visit to the next one that the parts might fall apart. I tell them, go enjoy your life. 
When it bothers you, come see me. That need should last your lifetime. How we communicate to the patient is very important. And this idea, we got to see these people all the time, every year, every couple of years for surveillance. I think the MA surgeon does that because they want to do the other knee and they don't want to go to somebody else that did the other knee. For us with K, they'll turn around and have it done. We don't have to talk them into it. We, we do a lot of those things out of tradition or dogma for sure, and that, that's a great point. Uh, thank you again so much for coming on. We really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you.